Oh, let me just clear my screen a minute. Okay. Uh, Mount Gullion. Gullion is Dutch for William. And Mount Gullion was the home of a prominent Dutch family known as Verplank. Um, you might be familiar with that name because, for instance, there is a Verplank Point a little bit south of Mount Gullion. Mount Gullion is in Beacon, not the city proper, but known as uh, the area is still known as the Beacon School District. Um, we are about a tenth of a mile north of the intersection of 9D and 84. So if, for instance, you were to come off of 84 from Nyack, instead of making a right into the city of Beacon, you would make a left onto 9D, go about a tenth of a mile, and we are tucked away in a condominium complex. So you cannot see us from the road, but if you endeavor, put your GPS on, go to our website for directions, and, and you're adventuresome enough, you'll make a left where our Revolutionary War sign is, and make another left into this condo complex. And at the end of the road is Mount Gulliam. Now, Mount Gulliam is was the, so, the home of the Verplank family. It was also um, a summer campsite before the home was built. The land was summer campsite for the Lenape people, actually the Wapani people or the Wappinger Indians who are part of the Lenape people. And we know from archaeology that the Native Americans use the land that Mount Gullion is now on going back to 6000 BC. So there was archaeology that was done there. Pits were dug. We found some material culture. And there's evidence that the Wappinger Indians used this campsite going back 6000 BC. It's right near the Hudson River. There's a creek on the site. And of course, it was well forested. So it had wonderful resources for the native people. The Verplank people, the family, and some um, business partners entered into an agreement with the Wappinger Indians and purchased 85,000 acres from the Wapani Indians, which is about a sixth of Dutchess County. It's known as the Rombout Patent. And it was divided up among Verplank. Francis Rombout and Stephanus Van Cortland. So that was the first patent um, in Dutchess County, and it was Gullian Verplank who was behind that with the Native American folks. And then Mount Gullian's history also relates to the Revolutionary War, because during the Revolutionary War, Mount Gullian served as the headquarters for General von Steuben. Von Steuben was the drill master and inspector. General for the Continental Army. And Mount Gullion was also in 1783 the birthplace of the Society of the Cincinnati, which is our country's first veterans organization formed at Mount Gullion, May 13, 1783. So it's got a Native American connection, an early Dutch settler connection, a Revolutionary War connection, and a Civil War connection because one of the Verplank descendants, Robert Newland Verplank, who was born at Mount Gullion, um, became an officer during the Civil War of the USCT, that is the US Colored Troops. Now this was a white man who was an officer of African American men who volunteered to fight in the Union Army during the Civil War. And then last but hardly least, and what you're going to hear about more tonight, is about James F. Brown. James was an escaped slave who somehow finds his way to New York and somehow meets the Verplanks. We're, you know, when you're in the history field, you're always doing research and we still don't know how it is that he connected with the Verplanks. We're, try, we're doing more research, trying to figure it out, don't have any documentation about it. But as the film will show, he meets the Verplanks and um, the Verplanks play, play a large part in his life because they manumit James. They purchase James's freedom and he becomes a free man. And as you'll hear in the film, 
he keeps almost a 40 year journal of his life in Beacon at Mount Gullion as the master gardener for the Blank House. And what I learned was, yes, it's a 40 year journal, but don't think of a journal as a diary today. James did not express his innermost thoughts. We're not gonna, when you read James's journal, you're not gonna read about his likes, his dislikes, his heartbreaks, his loves, his happiness. It's a journey of a gardener. Therefore, there's a lot about the weather. There's a lot about what he planted. And if, you, if you're patient with it, there is information about James and um, his visiting the churches in the area, his going to horticultural shows, his getting his watch repaired but it's not like a diary as we know it today. So that journal, which is at the New York Historical Society, and you can, and you can access it on their website, that journal gave us wonderful documentation about James. If we did not have that journal, if we did not have access to the information in that journal, we would not have been able to produce this film. This film is based on much of James's journal and other research that was done um, about James, one of which um, resulted in a book called Freedom's Gardener. I'll hold it up. I'm not sure if you can see that clearly enough, but Tracy tells me that it is at the Ny Nyack Library. It's by Professor Myra B. Yarn Young Armstead. Freedom's Gardener, James F. Brown, Horticulture, and the Hudson Valley, and Antebellum America. So with Myra's research and James's journals, we were able to um, put together the script and the information for, for, the, for the film. Now, the film was underwritten by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the IMLS, and NISCA, the New York State Council on the Arts. So with that, I would say um, we'll, we'll go to the film, Tracy, if that's good for you, and then we'll come back. I'll get some information about what else is happening at Mount Gullion and take people's questions. Sounds good. OK. Just bear with me for one second. This memorandum book was written by an old colored man. James F. Brown may have been an old colored man, but he was not an ordinary one. Born a slave in 1793, James became a free man in 1828, and just nine years later, he was a property owner and voter. For a black man in America before the Civil War, this was remarkable. How did a man born into slavery achieve freedom and economic independence? He cultivated it, like a gardener tends a garden. It took vision, hard work, and faith in himself to yield the fruit of freedom. Like a garden in spring, the new nation was full of promise for most of its people, but not all. Born a slave just six years after the ratification of the Constitution, James was not considered a citizen of his country. He did not even count as a man. As a slave, he was recognized by the Constitution as counting for only three-fifths of a man. As such, James did not have the rights guaranteed to white men by the new republic. For those born black in America, a bleak, dormant, and 
hopeless winter persisted. Little is known of James's early life. Born a slave in Maryland, by age 33 he had hired himself out for wages in Baltimore. A literate man, unusual for a slave, he probably learned to read and write as a youth through one of the local churches. He was also a free slave, one of a tiny minority who had a little latitude to conduct their own affairs, despite their slave status. This slight amount of autonomy and his literacy would prove fateful in the course of his life. After the Revolutionary War, many slaves in the Upper South had been freed entirely from slavery. In Baltimore, the free black population soon outnumbered slaves. James would have seen the opportunities freedom held for a hard-working man. The temptation to flee must have been irresistible. Encouraged by the promise of freedom made by a member of his owner's family, James set about creating a new life for himself. In September 1826, he married another slave, Julia Chase, and bought her freedom for $100. But the promise to free James was never honored. Frustrated, James finally fled north in August 1827, leaving behind a letter of explanation in which he carefully explained that he had no choice but to free himself. I know that you will be astonished and surprised when you become acquainted with the unexpected course that I am now about to take, a step that I never had the most distant ideal of taking. But what can a man do who has his hands bound and his feet fettered? It will certainly get them loose in any way that he may think the most advisable. James would no longer accept being considered three-fifths of a man. And manhood required freedom, even though escaping was extremely dangerous and the risk of recapture very real. In spring, hope comes alive as the ground is cleared and planted for a new season of growth. After leaving Baltimore, James and Julia Brown arrived in New York City he found work there as a waiter at the home of the Verplanks, a prominent and wealthy old New York Dutch family. Even with a job in the North, James was not safe. A dinner guest of the Verplanks recognized him as a former slave. Threatened with forcible return, James only escaped re-enslavement through the intervention of Daniel Cromelin Verplank, who wrote to Brown's owner, Susan Williams, in March 1828, to arrange the purchase of his freedom for about $300. By 1829, James was working as a coachman and gardener at Mount Gullion, the Hudson River estate of the Verplanks. Modeled on English formal gardens, Mount Gullion's garden was designed by Mary Anna Verplank, Daniel's precocious eldest daughter. At age 11, she researched and laid out the picturesque garden which attracted many visitors from the Hudson Valley. Traditionally, men planned and oversaw ornamental gardens, but Mariana was a self-reliant woman. She never married, living a life of independence unusual for women of her time. Like James, Mariana sought a level of freedom greater than the limits antebellum American society typically allowed for either blacks or women. In this respect, they had a natural affinity which combined with a love of gardening, formed the basis for an unusual and lifelong friendship. The normal and prescriptive role for women before the Civil War, particularly women of Mariana's station, was to be a wife and a mother. Mariana was able to conform to these uh, expectations, even though she wasn't married, partly because she was such a great aunt to her many nieces and nephews, but she moved even beyond that in her domestic duties outside of the house in her supervision of the estate and particularly the garden. When James came along, it was only natural that as he moved into the role of being master gardener that they would have a relationship, that they would have a working relationship, and it seems that it was very productive. 
James is proving to be a natural gardener. He seems to know instinctively what will succeed and what will not. And if he doesn't know, he sets out to acquire the knowledge from experts in the area. February 25th, 1844. Heard the bluebirds sing this afternoon. Around the time he came to Mount Gulian, James started a journal, which he kept continuously for 37 years. April 28th, 1829. The carpenters began the fence around the new god. In it, he recorded the ordinary details of daily life, season after season. 1835. Planted out peach trees, cherry trees, pear trees. Brown began entering horticultural exhibitions, sometimes winning cash prizes. Presented some Savoy cabbage and celery to the Horticultural Society and had a premium awarded for both. The horticultural world at this time was a closed society of wealthy white men, not typically open to blacks. So in order to participate in this horticultural world, you needed time, money, and education. This was a purposeful kind of avocation for these men. James could participate because he had time as a gardener. His time was all about horticulture. He had money that was supplied by the Verplanks. And he had knowledge because he was literate and because he apparently read horticultural publications. He also went out of his way to connect with gardeners, uh, servant gardeners, and also high-end horticulturalists uh, like the Verplanks themselves up and down the Hudson Valley. James Journal records that Mary Anna entered similar exhibitions. July 30th, 1830. Miss Mary Verplank and Mr. D.L. Walton left Fishgill for New York, presented some lima beans to the Horticultural Society for exhibition for which there was a premium awarded. As a woman, she was just as excluded as James, perhaps more so. While he probably needed sponsorship from horticultural associates to attend, she was required to be accompanied by a male. James entered produce from his garden at the Newburgh exhibition last month. He inspired me to try my own at New York, and to my astonishment, I won a prize. As Mount Gulian's gardener, Brown regularly interacted with prominent horticulturalists in New York. August 19, 1836, went to Mr. Downing's with some apple buds. H.J. Downing was right across the river. Anybody who was a serious horticulturalist would have gone there. James is having regular interactions with A.J. Downing. He connects not only with people at that level, but he also connects with master gardeners on these estates. He connects by the exchange of plantings, and it seems that he connects by social visits. July 23rd, Mr. J. Downing of the Botanical Garden at Newburgh paid us a visit. It is because of the patronage of the Verplanks. This would be unusual for a um, black man, but he has their stamp of approval and he has their stamp of, of approval in, a, in an activity that they care about. Before long, Brown was promoted to Master Gardener, an event he noted obliquely in his journal. Saturday, 12th, March, 1836. Resigned my place as coachman this day. Despite his modesty, this was an important event. Through talent and hard work, he advanced through the ranks from the lowest, garden laborer, to the highest, Master Gardener. James has acquitted himself admirably of late. I'm so happy to turn over responsibility for managing the hired help and the accounts. And he keeps the garden blooming wonderfully. In the nine years since his escape from slavery, he had become legally free and achieved a degree of economic security. But for James F. Brown, this was not enough. Following winter dormancy and the preparations of spring, in summer, a garden begins to mature and bear fruit. July 7, 1837. Took some peas and beans to New Just five months after his promotion. Haymaking and hauling. James F. Brown bought a house in nearby Fishgill Landing. August 2, 1836. Paid $100 to P.C. DeWent for lot number 37 on Division Street and received a deed for the same. 
For the former slave, buying property meant more than just owning his own home. It meant he could vote. At that time in New York State, any white man over the age of 21 could vote, but black men were required to own property. Brown later owned a house on Beacon Street. Owning property brought James a step closer to some measure of citizenship and freedom. He cast his first vote in the very next election. Wednesday, November 8th, 1837. The election at Fishkill took place this day, at which place James F. Brown voted for the first time. In a journal full of weather and work reports, the page devoted to his first vote is significant. Despite his understated manner, the fact that he recorded the event in the third person indicates that he recognized how unusual and historically significant it was for an African-American man to vote in New York State in 1837. November 7th, 1838, went to the election at Fishgill, voted and returned. He was so proud of participating in the electoral process that he recorded almost every election for the next 20 years. March 14th, 1854, town meeting today went up to Fishgill, voted for town officers. In many ways, Mary Anna, as an independent woman in the early 19th century, was just as unusual as James was in being an independent man of color. Most women were married and as such were denied the right to own property. However, as a single woman, Mary Anna had this right. During her lifetime, she bought and sold at least 20 pieces of property. But this did not confer upon her the right to vote that it did for James. October 19, 1837. Very busy gathering apples. Fall is harvest season. 1838. Took some passion flowers over to Mr. Nelson. Time Nelson's when the rewards of imagination, faith, and hard work are reaped. Gathered the grapes for winter this day and began packing them in cotton. James's life was rich with the rewards of his labor. He raised himself up from bondage to be a well respected man of property who paid taxes and voted, a citizen in all but in name. James died in Fishkill Landing, now Beacon, New York in January 1868, six months before ratification of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. This amendment, passed in the wake of the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation, extended citizenship to all those born in the United States, granting them many of the same rights James worked so diligently and faithfully to achieve for himself. As Master Gardener at Mount Gullion, James knew that what he planted and tended would ultimately bear fruit. He applied this knowledge to his life, believing that he would reap the harvest of his hard work. James F. Brown was never reflective in his journal, as was the custom of the time, but he did allow himself one observation. This memorandum book was written by an old colored man, contains a record of his marriage and of purchasing his wife's time for $100. This page is about recording the deed, he wrote in an undated entry. While at first he seems to express modesty about himself, the fact that he kept the journal for nearly 40 years to record the facts of his life reflects a view that the life he cultivated was worthy of note.
Um, I have a question. This is Renee. Um, I just was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit um, on this idea of a free, a free slave, or is that how they, they termed it? Um, yeah, um, and Myra in her book, Freedom's Gardener, um, explains that concept of being a free slave. Yes, James was still a slave. He had a master, he had a mistress, but as a free slave, what that meant is that he could work for other people um, with the agreement, of course, of his master. And so he might not work on the property that the Williams owned, but he would travel possibly even to Baltimore to work for other families. And then um, uh, with the income that he earned, he then of course would have to give a good part of that to um, Mr. and Mrs. Williams. So it gave him some mobility, being a free slave gave him some mobility um, and and it's um, it's our feeling that because he was able to be mobile, he didn't have to stay on the Williams's estate because he could travel as a free slave. We think maybe that enabled him to escape because we think he left from Baltimore um, a lot of. Um, ship traffic going on there. The P and and people in Baltimore well known James because of the work that he was doing for other families. So he so this concept of free slave. Yes, he was still a slave. He still belonged to the Williamses. He still had to give money to the Williams, but he could travel and work for other people as a free slave. And the money he made, he shared with them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for that question, Renee. Um, Elaine, Alex yeah. is asking what's James's middle name? Ah, uh, Francis. Now, um, James F. Brown, James Francis Brown was it's interesting because if you recall the graphic from the film where it's a letter between Daniel Cromwell and Verplank and James's owner, Mrs. Williams, right. she is referring to James as Anthony. Apparently, James had a couple of different names. And as a slave to in, in, in um, Maryland, he was known as Anthony Chase. But in um, Myra's research, she has determined that yes, this indeed Anthony Chase person was James F. Brown. And he then changed his name at some point. I don't know if it was still while he was in Maryland or once he came up to New York that he changed his name to James Francis Brown. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if uh, James and Anna had any children and what ended up happening with their family and if their kids went to school. I know. Good. Yeah, we don't. We believe that they had children, but the children died before they uh, ran away. The children died in Maryland and they did not, to the best of their, uh, our knowledge, there were no children in New York State. There were no children at, when he was at Mount Golan. So we don't know of any living relatives today. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, well, about the Verplank family. Um, yeah, I know that the uh, Dutch settlers of the New York, New Jersey area, uh, New, New Amsterdam, um, were uh, early slaveholders, mm -hmm. and um, you know, even the, the Dutch Reformed Church was behind slavery initially. I'm wondering if uh, the Verplank, uh, since they sponsored and uh, uh, paid for uh, his freedom, 
um, you know, if they they had a revulsion of feel, feeling against slavery um, fairly early on yes. in the family's history. Uh, and as a little side note, I'm wondering if Anne Verplank, the notable historian, is uh, a descendant. <laughs> um, Anne, is she in Los Angeles? No, I don't. I don't think so. She's a material culturalist. She's yes. She is related. Oh, okay. She's related to the family, yes. So to answer your question, the Verplanks that were part of the Mount Gulian line of Verplanks, as well as cousins of the Verplanks who are part of Verplanks Point, were definitely slave owners. Mm -hmm. No denying it. Um, they were uh, they were like majority of Dutch wealthy people in the 1600s, the early 1700s, that they own slaves. And actually, one of the documents in our collection is a deed of sale for a slave. That's quite uh, compelling when you see it. And this was between Philip Verplank, who was the owner of Verplank Point, and another Dutch person and purchasing a young man by the name of Robin. And this was, I believe this was early 1700s. So the Verplanks associated with Mount Gulliam and the Verplanks associated with Verplank Point were slave owners, no denying that. However, what we're, we're seeing with the Verplanks, the Mount Gulliam Verplanks, by the late 1700s, early 1800s, there's nothing on record that they're owning slaves. So we're thinking this family has evolved in their thinking, fortunately. And I guess that's the, that's the most you can hope for when it comes to slavery, is that there's an evolution of thought. The family no longer, as far as we can determine from documentation, census, letters, record books, they're no longer by the late 1700s, early 1800s, owning any slaves. That is to say, the people associated with Mount Gulliam. There's a change in their thinking, so much so that, as you saw from the film, Daniel Cromelin purchases James's freedom, asks Mrs. Williams, essentially, how much do you want for James? $300. And that's what's decided on. And Daniel Cromelin pays that to Mrs. Williams. And then we know, we have a feeling from James's journal that James is impressing Robert Newland for Plank. Robert Newland is the young man who volunteered to be an officer in the USCT. So we have this sense from James's records. He notes in his diary, a new child was born here at Mount Gullion and his name is Robert Newland. So we we our interpretation is that Robert was close to James. Robert definitely came in contact with blo black folks in Beacon and in Fishkill and in Wappinger Falls. And Robert had no problem working with black folks in the Civil War. So I think it's safe to say that the Verplanks had this evolution of thought with respect to slavery. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, Peter is asking, what is the status of the garden now, and is his burial site accessible? I'm sorry, what's the status of the garden, and what else? And if um, James' burial site is, if you can go visit it today. Um, James is buried at St. Luke's Cemetery in Beacon, as is his wife. And there is, um, the gravestone um, is prominent, so when you go to St. Luke's and Beacon, you can inquire about it or um, even maybe see it from the street. I think it's that close to the street. The garden, so what happened at Mount Gulian was the family lived there for 200 some odd years and in 1931 there was a fire and everything burnt to the ground except for the stonework. So the addition, which was made out of wood, was completely burnt and then with the family not being able to live there, the garden was completely ne neglected. So between 1931 and 1966, 
everything becomes overgrown. But in 1965, a descendant of the Verplanks, Beish Bleeker, decides he's going to reconstruct the original part of Mount Gulian, the part that relates to the Revolutionary War. And then in the 1970s, before Mount Gulian opened in 1975, a Verplank descendant who had visited the garden when she was a little girl, so we're talking before the fire, goes into the area she remembers as being the garden, and she finds peonies, yucca plants, and roses, brings them back to her house in Connecticut, and cultivates them. And then in the 1990s, when we're looking to restore the garden, because we were working constantly on restoring the garden, she donates these plants back to us. So folks, what this means is that the yucca, the peonies, and the roses in the Mount Gulian garden today have the same DNA as the original plants from when, from when Mariana was there and from when James was there. So today, whereas the garden was once six acres, it's a very small plot now that we are reconstructing We've cut down, we went into the, the garden area in the 1990s. I remember it was a July day. I was there, a couple of my board members and volunteers were there, and we were going to be determined to find where the garden was. We had a map from 1910. We had James's diary. We had Mrs. Verplank's books. We wanted to see if we could find anything. Well, this was July, and it was hot and humid and it felt like the Mekong Delta. <laughs> a bit up with mosquitoes, but we found, we found a, the remains of the pergola, which were on the original map and which were mentioned in James's diaries. We found another um, post in the ground, which when you look at the map is the beginning of the uh, garden. We found a couple of other things and based on that day and our findings and Mrs. Verplank's maps and James's diary, we have reconstructed and are working on the reconstruction of the formal part of the garden. So when you come to Mount Gullion today, you not only get to see the house and the barn, but the reconstructed garden. Hi, Elaine. Um, my name is Rosemary Farrell. I'm a colleague of Tracy's at the library. Mm -hmm. um, Alex has written a question. Uh, was the Verplank property that James managed a flower garden or a farm? How big was it and how much of it still exists today? Yeah, so it was a, uh, I, it was a six acre plot of land. Um, part of it was that formal garden, but the rest of it was a farm. So it had um, lots of fruit trees, it had vegetables. Um, uh, we have a map of it at Mount Gullion from 1910, which is, so that's 60 years after James passed away, but a lot of that 1910 structure and plantings um, were the same as when, when James was there. But now it's, you know, uh, six acres is a lot to manage. So now it's just a small, it's just a small ornamental garden that we, that we have for visitors to see and that we're trying to reconstruct. Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> the next question is how much were the Native American Indians paid for their land and what did his wife do for a living? Well, so James's wife, um, Julia, um, had a few different jobs. She, um, we do know that she would go up to Saratoga Springs in the summer to work for um, households up in Saratoga Springs, which even at that time was a tourist attraction of sorts. So she would go up for the summer, come back down, and then live with James in their house in Beacon. She also um, would, we know from Robert Newland's uh, correspondence, that Julia uh, was a cook for, uh, I think it was a school in Poughkeepsie, if I'm right about this. 
So she had other um, jobs in households other than at Saratoga Springs. Um, the other question was about the Native American folks. So in 1683, um, Gulliam Verplank and his partners acquire the property from the Native people. And this is 85,000 acres that they get. And the Native folks in exchange get about, we believe, $1,200 in goods um, in, in 1683. Now, what kind of goods? So they would have gotten items that they themselves didn't have that the Dutch had. They would get glass, um, even wampum. Of course, the Indians also had their own wampum. They would get um, mirrors, uh, some money um, at that time, um, and, uh, and an exchange of items for the property. Now, you might think that that's not fair, um, but understand this. When the sale of Manhattan occurred in the early 1600s, that was an, uh, the sale of land was a new concept for Native American Indians. It was very foreign to them. And um, by the 1680s, um, they were much more sophisticated and they, and they, and they knew the, uh, the value of these items and we believe thought more favorably about this trade than say the Indians did in the deal with the uh, with the sale of Manhattan. But to answer your question, it was about $1,200 worth of items in exchange. And this is called the Rombau patent. Angela is asked, has asked, uh, is there documentary evidence from the Verplank family that contributes to the understanding of James's role in their gardens and the in their gardens and in their life and in the on the farm, in the gardens. Yes, um, there is um, there there is correspondence in our collection. Uh, and in addition to that, there is um, a book, a genealogy that was written by a Verplank descendant in the late 1800s that, of course, talks a lot about the family and who's who, but also um, there is um, paragraphs uh, referring to James and James's living in Beacon and James's relationship with the Verplanks and as the gardener. And then, um, so there, there's that documentation, but as I said before, the primary documentation about his role in the garden comes from his, from his journals. Excuse me, I have a question. The, um, uh, this is Renee. I mm -hmm. just was wondering, do you have, um, can you give me some idea of just the parameters of the 65,000 acres? Like where did it start? Where did it go? Yep. So um, it's eighty five thousand. And oh, sorry, eighty five thousand. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so it. Um, are you familiar with a map of Dutchess County? Vaguely. Vaguely. Okay. Beacon. Are you familiar where Beacon is? I see, okay. Yeah, I know where it is. Yeah. Okay. So if we're starting at Beacon, let's say we're going up um, north. Mm -hmm. Passing the city of Beacon, um, Mount Gulian, Wappinger Falls, almost to Poughkeepsie. Okay, so that's not say take you're taking 9D, almost to the Poughkeepsie Gallery. Yeah? Okay. You're going east all the way across to Arlington, right? You're coming down through um, through East Fishkill and Fishkill, and in the 1600s, even uh, Cold Spring, which is now in Putnam County, was part of Dutchess County. So going down uh, East Fishkill, Fishkill, connecting, say, with 9D again, and then going south um, into Cold Spring. So the, the eastern side, the western side is the Hudson River? Starts Correct. Okay. Yes, yes. Absolutely. 
that's quite a chunk of change there. That's a chunk of change. <laughs> yeah. I did want to mention um, before we leave each other that Mount Gulian is open for tours. We're happy to report. Right now, we're open on Fridays and Sundays um, at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 2 o'clock. We do prefer uh, registration. You could even do it 10 minutes before arriving. Um, so that's right now, Fridays and Sundays at 12, 1, and 2. Um, but you could also show up. Um, and if we have room, we'd be glad to give you a tour. The tour would include the house, the barn, um, and the garden. And we have a view of the Hudson River. But then we're, we're involved in a special um, event, July 17th and 18th, in conjunction with um, Dutchess Tourism. Mount Coulian and about seven other historic sites in Dutchess County are, are having a, a Great Estates Garden and Landscape Tour. We're going to be open the 17th and 18th so that we can specifically give visitors a tour of the garden and also um, relate to you information about gardening and how gardening was done and what the techniques were done in the 19th century during James's time and also taking some suggestions from Mrs. Verplank's book. She wrote two garden books. So you'll see the garden. We'll talk about the plantings. We'll also talk about um, how people gardened um, in the 19th century and the early 20th century. The, the other sites that are going to be involved in this include Wilderstein and Vanderbilt Mansion, Locust Grove. I'm forgetting a couple of other state sites. But if you go on Dutchess Tourism's website, July 17th and 18th, you'll see what sites are involved. And we're all open both days and we're giving tours at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock and 1 p.m. And again, preference is registration, but if you just show up, I'm sure we'll be able to accommodate you. That's wonderful. Okay. Very good. Anyone else? Okay. If you, if you need information um, about James, I would say if you go onto the New York Historical Society's website, they should have access to his journals. But if you're running into any issues, you could certainly email me. And um, my email, could you give that, Tracy, or should I give it now? Sure, I'll do it right now. OK, if you'd like to, um, if you need to follow up, you need some more information. Um, please shoot me off an email. I'd be happy to help. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine, for being here. I appreciate Thank it. you very much. Thank you very much for spending time with us. I hope Thank to see you today at Mount Gulian. Thank you. That was, that was very interesting. Really wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good evening.